First reading this evening is taken from Psalm 40, which can be found on page 566 in the Church Bibles. For the director of music of David, a psalm, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears have been opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sin has overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that whether we are living in a time of plenty or whether we're living in a time of empty, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just pray that you open our ears, that we might hear your word, and that we might act upon it, that we might take your law and hide it in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So let me begin with a question. When do you need help? Is it when your cam belt goes on your Vauxhall Zafira on the M62, on your way to Yorkshire training with a car full of students and a presentation to give? Or is it when you can't hear what people are saying as clearly or as audibly as you used to? And then there's sometimes when no one can help when your computer hard drive's been erased, or when the doctor says there is nothing more that he can do. Where do we turn in those situations? We know we should look to God for help, but will God help us? And how should we behave in those times? I think the psalmist here in Psalm 40 is an excellent role model for such situations, and I recommend you bookmark it. You read it before you go to work tomorrow morning. So the psalmist begins his song looking back at past times when he needed the help of the Lord and he rescued him. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. The psalmist, he had waited patiently for the Lord back then. And the Lord had heard and acted. But his rescue wasn't instant. Literally, it reads, waiting, I waited for the Lord. Hence, the need for patience. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. Now, I don't know what this slimy pit was. 
Some people like Jeremiah ended up in one, quite literally. And David, who it says wrote this psalm, it could refer to any number of the sticky situations that he'd found himself in. But you see, the beauty of not knowing exactly what this slimy pit refers to means that we have a wide diversity of application. This psalm can speak to any number of dark holes that we find ourselves in the bottom of. Maybe your loved one is ill. Perhaps you're ill. Or a relationship has ended badly. Or your children have walked away from the Lord. The image of that slimy pit is apt. You have no sure ground. In an instant, you could slip and fall. It's like walking along on the seaweed on a sea wall when you could suddenly slip and be thrown into the sea and onto the rocks. But instead of destruction, instead of being consumed by that miry pit, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. The psalmist has security, the reliability to face the situation. The situation hasn't changed, but by God's grace, its destructive nature has been arrested. Therefore, he rejoices and he sings about the Lord's good grace in his life. Verse 3. His natural reaction is to glorify God. Do we do that? When we're wondering where our next meal is coming from, and that brother invites us around for dinner, or we're fretting about how we're going to pay that bill, and then suddenly a check comes through the door, do we sing praise, do we glorify God in such a way that we demonstrate to the people around us how great our God is? Or do we focus on ourselves, thinking, that was lucky, not a moment too soon? And this is just the key point in the psalmist's mind. When he's asking for rescue, it's not about his comfort and rescue, but it's about the Lord's glory. When people see and hear of our rescue, it shouldn't be how fortunate are we, but how awesome and how gracious our God is. Now, ultimately, this isn't about how we got our washing machine fixed or how you meet your husband or your wife or even about an illness going into remission. See, the ultimate rescue that we're about to sing about is our salvation through the cross of Christ, of which I will develop more in a minute. Our prayer is that many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. So the psalmist's experience of the Lord's grace in the past leads him to look upwards, verses 4 and 5, to the Lord with trust in the present and the future. Now, the Lord uses all manner of agencies to rescue his people. It wasn't some kind of celestial hand that reached out of the sky and pulled Jeremiah out of the miry well. The Lord sent Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian eunuch, and a rope to pull him out. David's rebellious son wasn't struck down by God and eaten by worms. Herod Agrippa was. No, Absalom got caught by his hair in a tree and was dispatched by Joab with a sword. But if we look no further than these agencies for our deliverance, we're likely to become proud and self-assured. and We start to believe how fortunate we were to make that friend or invest in that scheme. This, though, is nothing short of idolatry. Rather than worshipping the Lord who delivers, we find ourselves worshipping the deliverance itself. The psalmist warns, don't do that. That's tantamount to worshipping false gods. Judah and Israel often were putting their trust in the nations around them. Egypt was their go-to number. Pharaoh was on speed dial. And it's no coincidence, though, that the word for proud in verse 4 there, Rahab, is also the Hebrew word that is used in the poetic literature to refer to Egypt. And that is particularly ironic, as we read in verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. Because wonders were precisely what the Lord performed in Egypt in the days of the Exodus. God is bigger than Egypt. He's bigger than any agency that he sends to rescue you. If God chooses you to deliver people through the agency of Egypt, then that's in his providence to do so. But it's not the thing that we're to trust in. We are to trust in the incomparable God and dwell on his countless deeds. 
And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for all the books that would be written. So the psalmist, who can look back at the deeds of God in the past and look upwards to his greatness in the present, he is the one who can look inward to his own heart and there find the attitude which God will bless. The response to the mighty saving wonders that the Lord had worked in our lives is not sacrifice, as if throwing a metaphorical bull on the altar's bonfire is some kind of way of settling a bill that we owe God. Well, you got me this job, Lord. I suppose I ought to go and work in Globe Cafe now. Or maybe I should start to read my Bible a bit more. See, it's not about external duty, but it's about inward obedience. Are you listening to what the Lord is saying? Have your ears had their spiritual wax dug out of them? Do we listen and heed the word of God? Or are we too busy with the externals of sacrifice, rushing from one meeting or sacrifice to the next, but never stopping to hear and apply? And so the psalmist says in verse 7, Here I am, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written in my heart. Now for King David, to whom this psalm is ascribed, and his successors, there are some very specific instructions for them in the scroll, in Deuteronomy 17 in particular. It was the king's job to study, meditate on, and keep the law of God in his heart. But the law was written to all the people of God, It wasn't just the leader's job to keep the law in their hearts. It was everyone's responsibility. It was just the king's job to lead by example. Now, the timeless applicability of the Psalms means that even if the Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us. And in that vein, we can speak of ourselves being written in the scroll. Let's be those who keep the law in our hearts and desire to do God's will. Yet these verses find their ultimate fulfilment in the person of Jesus Christ. Just as we heard in our second reading from the letter of Hebrews in chapter 10 this evening. Here, the system of animal sacrifice is no longer desired because it has been replaced by the perfect, righteous obedience of Jesus. But an obedience which led to the most fearful blood sacrifice of all. But We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, it says, because the blood of bulls and rams could never take away sins. But when Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Therefore, with the psalmist looking outwards, now we should cry out, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. The psalmist, he died before he ever knew the great salvation of the cross that we know today. But even he couldn't keep quiet about the shadows of the glory yet to come. The Lord's countless grace in rescuing him. If the Lord's infinitesimal greatness directs our psalmist's attention outward... How much more we? We're not looking at the shadows. We're looking at the real thing. How can we keep silent about such saving grace? We've been rescued from something far worse than a slimy pit. We've been saved from a fiery pit. And not just rescued from eternal punishment, but we have become children of the living God, whom we can call Father, who delights to hear our prayers, with whom now We have an eternal relationship. Hallelujah. That's something to proclaim in the great assembly, not to keep tight-lipped about. Let's share with all we meet about the Lord's faithfulness, saving help and love. In short, let's share the gospel. Because verse 11 should be translated as a statement, not as a prayer. You do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. Your love and faithfulness always protects me. But then, but then what happens? The psalmist looks around, and what does he see? Verse 12, for troubles without number surround me. My sin has overtaken me. 
I cannot see. Death are more than my hairs on my head, and my heart fails within me. The psalmist has been in desperate circumstances all along. All the while he's been looking back and looking up and looking inward, these circumstances have been raging all around him all the time. Those lines were being sung in the midst of this situation, the situation being described in verse 12. And this verse uses the imagery usually reserved for the description of the pounding surf of the sea. Many troubles without numbers, more than the hairs on his head surround the psalmist, while at the same time his own sin overtakes him, like waves crashing down on a shipwrecked survivor in the open sea. The tempest is so great that like the imperiled swimmer, he's no no longer able to see beyond the immediate life-threatening circumstances. Isolated and desperate, the psalmist is on the brink of losing all hope. My heart fails within me, he says. How often do we feel that two-pronged attack? From one angle comes the external circumstances that squeeze us hard. People who appear to discredit us and our message. Illness or family that cause us despair. And then from another angle, from within, we are confronted with our own sinful nature. The desires of the flesh, the issues we struggle with. It's as if all life is conspiring to bring you down, as if something is seeking your destruction. But the psalmist, the psalmist knows that the Lord is the one in whom he should trust. He may have troubles without number, but he's going to turn to the God whose deeds for him are too many to declare. His circumstances may be frightening, but the Lord's terrifying wonders once brought mighty Egypt to its knees. This is the one to whom we should pray. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. But whether the psalmist is rescued in this present age or in the age to come is less important to him than the vindication of God's name. His request for his enemies to be put to shame in verses 14 to 15 is not about being vindictive or trying to get even with people that didn't like him. Unfortunately, if we don't ask the question, who are these enemies, then the psalmist's attitude appears to us as spiteful and offensive, expressing personal animosities. For this reason, some have sought to remove such distasteful verses from the Christian life. And therefore, the 1980 edition of the Alternative Service Book of the Church of England, um, they marked passages in 13 psalms, including the whole of Psalm 58, as may be omitted in public worship. Notwithstanding that the 1662 prayer book stated the whole Psalter should be read through once a month. Fortunately, such editorial high-handedness was repealed in 2000 with the publication of Common Worship. So we can once again read the entire book of Psalms every month. But the point is that such language isn't just found in the so-called imprecatory psalms or the cursing psalms. From Moses in Deuteronomy 28 to Paul in Galatians 1, from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22, all these imprecations or curses have a similar object. They are directed against those who reject what God has said. These are the enemies. The psalmist identifies with the Lord, not with false gods. The conflict we see here, then, is between the one who has accepted the Lord's authority and others who have rejected it. The psalmist was on the Lord's side, and his enemies were the Lord's enemies. True, it was over his distress that they were gloating, but it was really the Lord with whom they were at odds with. Therefore, anyone who we've told about the awesome rescue of our loving, self-giving God and chooses to reject him should be put to shame. As my mum would say, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. How can men and women treat so lightly or with such derision the God who created them and gives them the very breath that they breathe and ultimately the death of his son on the cross for their salvation? They should be appalled at their own shame. But finally, the psalmist looks forward to the final consummation of his salvation. 
Just as he said, may all who want to take my life, i.e. God's enemies, be put to shame and confusion, he now declares, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. No, what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, may all who seek you be pulled out of miry pits, or all who seek you may be rescued from their enemies. The psalmist's focus is on God and God alone. He exhorts people who are suffering, who are in trouble, to rejoice and be glad in the Lord. As we are waiting for our exam results, our medical results, our benefits assessments, we are to continually say, the Lord is great. We are not to seek the rescue from personal disaster for our own sakes, but that we might glorify God through it, just as the psalmist said so in verse 3, so that many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And the psalmist recognizes who he is before the Lord. But as for me, I am poor and needy. He demonstrates his humility and his status when standing before the Lord, which is all the more remarkable if we imagine the psalmist as King David, with all his wealth, his warriors, his wives, and his wine. None of that counts one jot in the face of impending peril. Neither does it carry any weight before the Lord God Almighty. Yet the psalmist recognizes the huge gulf between the Lord and himself. Yet the psalmist recognizes that with his outside pressures of the world and the enemy and his internal struggles with the sin, he states, but the Lord thinks of me. The Lord of whom he has sung about, the gracious rescuing God, the Almighty who raises up nations and brings them low, whose wonders and deeds are too many to declare, thinks of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the rescuing God who delivers his people. And there are some here tonight who may feel that the pressure of life and sin is almost suffocating them. I pray that they and that any of us in those situations would look back to the cross, to the greatest rescue that you have ever performed for men and women. That you are the God who can be trusted whatever the outcome Lift our eyes upward that we might gaze upon your glory and majesty where the long shadow of our circumstances will fade. Let us be found being the ones who desire to do your will, keeping your law in our hearts, not forsaking it because the sea around us is becoming rough. We will proclaim your saving acts, unseal lips that have been too tightly shut. Give us a Holy Spirit boldness to share your gospel with those around us. Let those who reject you be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you say, the Lord is great. Amen. <laughs>